Welcome to a fireside reading of Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 35 The Winter at Queen's Anne's homesickness wore off, greatly helped in the wearing by her weekend visits home. As long as the open weather lasted, the Avonlea students went out to Carmody on the New Branch Railway every Friday night. Diana and several other Avonlea young folks were generally on hand to meet them, and they all walked over to Avonlea in a merry party. Anne thought those Friday evening gypsyings over the autumnal hills in the crisp golden air with the home lights of Avonlea twinkling beyond were the best and dearest hours in the whole week. Gilbert Blythe nearly always walked with Ruby Gillis and carried her satchel for her. Ruby was a very handsome young lady. Now thinking herself quite as grown up as she really was, she wore her skirts as long as her mother would let her and did her hair up in town, though she had to take it down when she went home. She had large, bright blue eyes, a brilliant complexion, and a plump, showy figure. She laughed a great deal, was cheerful and good-tempered, and enjoyed the pleasant things of life, frankly. But I shouldn't think she was the sort of girl Gilbert would like, whispered Jane to Anne. Anne did not think it so either, but she would not have said so for the Avery scholarship. She could not help thinking, too, that it would be very pleasant to have such a friend as Gilbert to jest and chatter with and exchange ideas about books and studies and ambitions. Gilbert had ambitions, she knew, and Ruby Gillis did not seem the sort of person with whom such could be profitably discussed. There was no silly sentiment in Anne's ideas concerning Gilbert. Boys were to her, when she thought about them at all, merely possible good comrades. If she and Gilbert had been friends, she would not have cared how many other friends he had, nor with whom he walked. She had a genius for friendship. Girlfriends she had in plenty, but she had a vague consciousness that masculine friendship might also be a good thing to round out one's conceptions of companionship and further broaden standpoints of judgment and comparison. Not that Anne could have put her feelings on the matter into just such clear definition, but she thought that if Gilbert had ever walked home with her from the train over the crisp fields and along the ferny byways, they might have had many and merry and interesting conversations about the new world that was opening around them and their hopes and ambitions therein. Gilbert was a clever young fellow with his own thoughts about things and a determination to get the best out of life and put the best into it. Ruby Gillis told Jane Andrews that she didn't understand half the things Gilbert Blythe said. He talked just like Anne Shirley did when she had a thoughtful fit on, and for her part, she didn't think it any fun to be bothering about books and that sort of thing when you didn't have to. Frank Stockley had lots more dash and go, but then he wasn't half as good-looking as Gilbert, and she really couldn't decide which she liked best. In the Academy, Anne gradually drew a little circle of friends about her, thoughtful, imaginative, ambitious students like herself, with the rose-red girl, Stella Maynard, and the dream girl, Priscilla Grant. She soon became intimate, finding the latter pale, spiritual-looking maiden to be full to the brim of mischief and pranks and fun, while the vivid, black-eyed Stella had a heart full of wistful dreams and fancies as aerial and rainbow-like as Anne's own. After the Christmas holidays, the Avonlea students gave up going home on Fridays. 
and settled down to hard work. By this time, all the Queen's scholars had gravitated into their own places in the ranks, and the various classes had assumed distinct and settled shadings of individuality. Certain facts had become generally accepted. It was admitted that the medal contestants had practically narrowed down to three, Gilbert Blythe, Anne Shirley, and Lewis Wilson. The Avery scholarship was more doubtful, any one of a certain six being a possible winner. The bronze medal for mathematics was considered as good as won by a fat, funny little upcountry boy with a bumpy forehead and a patched coat. Ruby Gillis was the handsomest girl of the year at the Academy. In the second year classes, Stella Maynard carried off the palm for beauty, with small but critical minority in favour of Anne Shirley. Ethel Marr was admitted by all competent judges to have been the most stylish modes of hairdressing, and Jane Andrews, plain, plodding, conscientious Jane, carried off the honours in the domestic science course. Even Josie Pye attained a certain preeminence as the sharpest-tongued young lady in attendance at Queen's. So it may be fairly stated that Miss Stacy's old pupils held their own in the wider arena of the academical course. Anne worked hard and steadily. Her rivalry with Gilbert was as intense as it had ever been in Avonlea School, although it was not known in the class at large, but somehow the bitterness had gone out of it. Anne no longer wished to win for the sake of defeating Gilbert, rather for the proud consciousness of a well-won victory over a worthy foeman. It would be worthwhile to win, but she no longer thought life would be insupportable if she did not. In spite of lessons, the students found opportunities for pleasant times, Anne spent many of her spare hours at Beechwood and generally ate her Sunday dinners there and went to church with Miss Barry. The latter was, as she admitted, growing old, but her black eyes were not dim nor the vigour of her tongue in the least abated, but she never sharpened the latter on Anne, who continued to be a prime favourite with the critical old lady. That Anne girl improves all the time, she said. I get tired of other girls. There is such a provoking and eternal sameness about them. Anne has as many shades as a rainbow, and every shade is the prettiest while it lasts. I don't know that she is as amusing as she was when she was a child, but she makes me love her and I like people who make me love them. It saves me so much trouble in making myself love them. Then, almost before anybody realised it, spring had come. Out in Avonlea, the Mayflowers were peeping pinkly out on the sere barrens where snow wreaths lingered, and the mist of green was on the woods and in the valleys. But in Charlottetown, harassed Queen's students thought and talked only of examinations. It doesn't seem possible that the term is nearly over, said Anne. Why, last fall it seemed so long to look forward to, a whole winter of studies and classes, and here we are, with the exams looming up next week. Girls, sometimes I feel as if those exams meant everything, but... When I look at the big buds swelling on those chestnut trees and the misty blue air at the end of the streets, they don't seem half so important. Jane and Ruby and Josie, who had dropped in, did not take this view of it. To them, the coming examinations were constantly very important indeed, far more important than chestnut buds or Maytime hazes. It was all very well for Anne, who was sure of passing, at least to have her moments of belittling them, but when your whole future depended on them, as the girls truly thought theirs did, 
you could not regard them philosophically. I've lost seven pounds in the last two weeks, sighed Jane. It's no use to say don't worry. I will worry. Worrying helps you some. It seems as if you were doing something when you're worrying. It would be dreadful if I failed to get my license after going to Queen's all winter and spending so much money. I don't care, said Josie Pye. If I don't pass this year, I'm coming back next. My father can afford to send me. And Frank Stockley says that Professor Tremaine said Gilbert Blythe was sure to get the medal and that Emily Clay would likely win the Avery Scholarship. <laughs> that may make me feel badly tomorrow, Josie, laughed Anne, but just now I honestly feel that as long as I know the violets are coming out all purple down in the hollow below green gables, and that little ferns are poking their heads up in Lover's Lane. It's not a great deal of difference whether I win the Avery or not. I've done my best, and I begin to understand what is meant by the joy of the strife. Next to trying and winning, the best thing is trying and failing. Girls, don't talk about exams. Look at that arch of pale green sky over those houses and picture to yourself what it must look like over the purpley dark beech woods back of Avonlea. What are you going to wear for commencement, Jane? asked Ruby practically. Jane and Josie both answered at once and the chatter drifted into a side eddy of fashion. But Anne, with her elbows on the window sill, her soft cheek laid against her clasped hands, and her eyes filled with visions, looked out unheedingly across city roof and spire to that glorious dome of sunset sky, and wove her dreams of a possible future from the golden tissue of youth's own optimism. All the beyond was hers with its possibilities lurking rosily in the oncoming years, each year a rose of promise to be woven into an immortal chaplet. Chapter 36 The Glory and the Dream On the morning when the final results of all the examinations were to be posted on the bulletin board at Queen's, Anne and Jane walked down the street together. Jane was smiling and happy. Examinations were over and she was comfortably sure she had made a pass, at least. Further considerations troubled Jane not at all. She had no soaring ambitions and consequently was not affected with the unrest attendant thereon. For we pay a price for everything we get or take in this world, and although ambitions are well worth having, they are not to be cheaply won, but exact their dues of work and self-denial, anxiety and discouragement. Anne was pale and quiet. In ten more minutes she would know who had won the medal, and who the Avery. Beyond those ten minutes, there did not seem just then to be anything worth being called time. Of course you'll win one of them anyhow, said Jane, who couldn't understand how the faculty could be so unfair as to order it otherwise. I have not hope of the Avery, said Anne. Everybody says Emily Clay will win it. And I'm not going to march up to that bulletin board and look at it before everybody. I haven't the moral courage. I'm going straight to the girls' dressing room. You must read the announcements and then come and tell me, Jane. And I implore you in the name of our old friendship to do it as quickly as possible. If I have failed, just say so without trying to break it gently. And whatever you do, don't sympathize with me. Promise me this, Jane. 
Jane promised solemnly. But as it happened, there was no necessity for such a promise. When they went up the entrance steps of Queen's, they found the hall full of boys who were carrying Gilbert Blythe around on their shoulders and yelling at the tops of their voices, Hurrah for Blythe! Medalist! For a moment, Anne felt one sickening pang of defeat and disappointment. So, she had failed. And Gilbert had won. Well, Matthew would be sorry. He had been so sure she would win. And then somebody called out, Three cheers for Miss Shirley, winner of the Avery! Oh, Anne! gasped Jane as they fled to the girls' dressing room amid hearty cheers. Oh, Anne, I'm so proud! Isn't it splendid? And then the girls were around them, and Anne was the centre of a laughing, congratulating group. Her shoulders were thumped, and her hands shaken vigorously. She was pushed and pulled and hugged, and among it all she managed to whisper to Jane, Oh, won't Matthew and Marilla be pleased? I must write the news home right away. Commencement was the next important happening. The exercises were held in the big assembly hall of the academy. Addresses were given, essays read, songs sung, the public award of diplomas, prizes and medals made. Matthew and Marilla were there, with eyes and ears for only one student on the platform, a tall girl in pale green with faintly flushed cheeks and starry eyes, who read the best essay and was pointed out and whispered about as the Avery winner. Reckon you're glad we kept her, Marilla? whispered at Matthew, speaking for the first time since he had entered the hall. When Anne had finished her essay, it's not the first time I've been glad, retorted Marilla. You do like to rub things in, Matthew Cuthbert. Miss Barry, who was sitting behind them, leaned forward and poked Marilla in the back with her parasol. Aren't you proud of that Anne girl? I am, she said. Anne went home to Avonlea with Matthew and Marilla that evening. She had not been home since April, and she felt that she could not wait another day. The apple blossoms were out, and the world was fresh and young. Diana was at Green Gables to meet her. In her own white room, where Marilla had set a flowering house rose on the window sill, Anne looked about her and drew a long breath of happiness. Oh, Diana, it's so good to be back again. It's so good to see those pointed firs coming out against the pink sky and that white orchard and the old snow queen. Isn't the breath of the mint delicious? And that tea rose, why, it's a song and a hope and a prayer all in one. And it's so good to see you again, Diana. I thought you liked that Stella Maynard better than me, said Diana reproachfully. Josie Pye told me you did. Josie said you were infatuated with her. Anne laughed and pelted Diana with the faded June lilies of her bouquet. Stella Maynard is the dearest girl in the world except one. And you are that one, Diana. She said, I love you more than ever, and I've so many things to tell you. But just now, 
I feel as if it were joy enough to sit here and look at you. I'm tired, I think. Tired of being studious and ambitious. I mean to spend at least two hours tomorrow lying in the orchard grass thinking of absolutely nothing. You've done splendidly, Anne. I suppose you won't be teaching now that you've won the Avery. No, I'm going to Redmond in September. Doesn't it seem wonderful? I'll have a brand new stock of ambition laid in by that time. After three glorious golden months of vacation, Jane and Ruby are going to teach. Isn't it splendid to think we all got through, even to Moody Spurgeon and Josie Pye? The Newbridge trustees have offered Jane their school already, said Diana. Gilbert Blythe is going to teach too. He has to. His father can't afford to send him to college next year after all, so he means to earn his own way through. I expect he'll get the school here if Miss Ames decides to leave. Anne felt a queer little sensation of dismayed surprise. She had not known this. She had expected that Gilbert would be going to Redmond also. What would she do without their inspiring rivalry? Would not work, even at a co-educational college with a real degree in prospect, be rather flat without her friend, the enemy? The next morning at breakfast, it suddenly struck Anne that Matthew was not looking well. Surely he was much greyer than he had been a year before. Marilla, she said hesitatingly when he'd gone out, is Matthew quite well? No, he isn't, said Marilla in a troubled tone. He's had some real bad spells with his heart this spring and he won't spare himself a mite. I've been real worried about him, but he's some better this while back and we've got a good hired man, so I'm hoping he'll kind of rest and pick up. Maybe he will now you're home. You always cheer him up. Anne leaned across the table and took Marilla's face in her hands. You are not looking as well yourself as I'd like to see you, Marilla. You look tired. I'm afraid you've been working too hard. You must take a rest now that I'm home. I'm just going to take this one day off to visit all the dear old spots and hunt up my old dreams, and then it will be your turn to be lazy while I do the work. Marilla smiled affectionately at her girl. It's not the work. It's my head. I've got a pain so often now behind my eyes. Dr. Spencer's been fussing with glasses, but they don't do me any good. There is a distinguished oculist coming to the island the last of June, and the doctor says I must see him. I guess I'll have to. I can't read or sew with any comfort now. Well, Anne, you've done real well at Queen's, I must say to take first-class license in one year and win the Avery Scholarship. <laughs> well, well, Mrs. Lynde says pride goes before a fall and she doesn't believe in the higher education of women at all. She says it unfits them for woman's true sphere. I don't believe a word of it. Speaking of Rachel reminds me, did you hear anything about the Abbey Bank lately, Anne. I heard it was shaky, answered Anne. Why? That is what Rachel said. She was up here one day last week and said there was some talk about it. Matthew felt real worried. All we have saved is in that bank, every penny. I wanted Matthew to put it in the savings bank in the first place, but old Mr. Abbey was a great friend of father's and he'd always banked with him. Matthew said any bank with him at the head of it was good enough for anybody. I think he has only been its nominal head for many years, said Anne. He is a very old man. His nephews are really at the head of the institution. Well, 
When Rachel told us that, I wanted Matthew to draw our money right out, and he said he'd think of it, but Mr. Russell told him yesterday that the bank was all right. Anne had her good day in the companionship of the outdoor world. She never forgot that day. It was so bright and golden and fair, so free from shadow and so lavish of blossom. Anne spent some of its rich hours in the orchard. She went to the Dryad's Bubble and Willamere violet veil. She called at the manse and had a satisfying talk with Mrs. Allen. And finally, in the evening, she went with Matthew for the cows through Lover's Lane to the back pasture. The woods were all gloried through with sunset and the warm splendour of it streamed down through the hill gaps in the west. Matthew walked slowly with bent head. Anne, tall and erect, suited her springing step to his. "'You've been working too hard today, Matthew,' she said reproachfully. "'Why won't you take things easier?' "'Well, now, I can't seem to,' said Matthew as he opened the yard gate to let the cows through. "'It's only that I'm getting old, Anne, and keep forgetting it. Well, well, I've always worked pretty hard, and I'd rather drop in harness. If I had been the boy you sent for, said Anne, wistfully, I'd be able to help you so much now and spare you in a hundred ways. I could find it in my heart to wish I had been, just for that. Well, now, <laughs> I'd rather have you than a dozen boys had, said Matthew, patting her hand. Just mind you that, rather than a dozen boys. Well, now, I guess it wasn't a boy that took the Avery Scholarship, was it? It was a girl, my girl, <laughs> my girl that I'm proud of. He smiled his shy smile at her as he went into the yard. Anne took the memory of it with her when she went to her room that night and sat for a long while at her open window, thinking of the past, and dreaming of the future. Outside, the Snow Queen was mistily white in the moonshine. The frogs were singing in the marsh beyond Orchard Slope. Anne always remembered the silvery, peaceful beauty and fragrant calm of that night. It was the last night before sorrow touched her life, and no life is ever quite the same again when once that cold, sanctifying touch has been laid upon it. Oh no, ah, it doesn't bode well for tomorrow. Uh, this really is a wonderful book. I, I am sure you're enjoying it as much as I am, uh, and I can't wait for tomorrow. Well, like, uh, yeah, but I'm afraid we all kind of know something bad's going to happen. Uh, however, I will see you all tomorrow at the same time, time and place, five Pacific, at Fireside Reading on Instagram, and all the chapters I upload to the YouTube channel Fireside reading. Please subscribe if you would like to that. Until I see you again, please stay very well.